but whenever, uh, whenever Pastor Rhett reached out to me today, or reached out to me about speaking today, and he indicated in his uh, text to me, you know, what today was. And <clears throat> Here we go again. <laughs> And then I realized, I just began having some things just kind of poured to my, my heart regarding that. So when you get through watching that, you have this feeling of this whole sense of unity and pride in our nation. And do you remember a time when we came together as one? There was a time some of the older people might remember, but in our lifetime, it's just like we were never so unified and galvanized as a country uh, to have one goal, and that was to go and defeat the people that did this. <clears throat> and aren't we thankful that, uh, that we're still basking in the glow of that unity and that pride? And I say that very facetiously, of course. It was a time when both parties of Congress stood on the steps of the Congress and saying, God bless America. It was a time of national pride back then. <clears throat> but yet, a few days ago, our president delivered a message that probably is one of the most divisive messages that's ever been preached, excuse me, spoken from the, from the top office of the country. And according to that message, the vast majority of you in here are a threat to our democracy. I'm like John Michael, I'm not going to get political. I'm just talking about where we are today versus where we were <coughs> back then. How quickly we've forgotten. How quickly that all of that went away. That unity, that national pride, the love for one another. <coughs> and it was just 20 years ago. That's not a long time, 21 years. That's the anniversary. Today's the anniversary of mine and Terry's 21st uh, year of being here. We came, 9-11 happened on a Tuesday, and we came that following Sunday. And uh, never left, thank the good Lord. But to understand how <clears throat> things can so quickly deteriorate, from where we were then to where we are now, you have to realize that our nation began falling many years before then. And that was just like a little blip that happened. And it kind of resurfaced a little bit, kind of like if you watch the stock market and how it'll go up and then there's a little correction. And it'll keep going up, a little correction. Except for the last couple of years, of course, it's down, a little correction, down, a little correction. <clears throat> But it, it's the same way, but our, our nation has been in a path of descent. And we're going to go back and we're going to track uh, where a lot of that really began. When our forefathers came here hundreds of years ago, they came to, to experience religious freedom in their lives, some for the first time, but to get away from the, the persecution and the tyranny uh, of the, the carnal and the uh, idolatrous rulers that they were trying to get away from. And yet since then, we've gone from being that shining light on the hill that was welcoming so many other people desperate for a, a free place to worship and to live. We've gone from there, pendulum has swung fully in the other direction to where we are the number one exporter of pornography in the entire world. How does that happen? You know, how, how do we fall so far? I just, I got an email a couple of days ago from the American Center for Law and Justice, uh, Jay Sekulow's uh, organization. And somebody may can verify this. I knew this bill was out there in California, but it appears they've just passed it. And it's the bill that legalizes infanticide or the killing of infants up to 28 days after they're born. Now, coming from his organization, I, I think it's real, and now it's just going to be heading to Governor Newsom's desk uh, to be signed. 
Pastor Ritz always said, yeah, the safest place in the womb was always, or safest place for a baby should have always been in the womb, but now it's not even outside of the womb for the first four weeks. I mean, it's, it's insane where we've gone. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend the next few minutes discussing all of that and then looking into God's Word to see what He says about how we can prevent such calamities from ever happening in our own spiritual lives, in our walk with Him. I'd like to say that we, this nation is going to be restored to this level of greatness, but it's like we've said so many times, the culture's been lost, but your family hasn't been lost. You haven't been lost. And so we're going to talk about that for a few minutes, and we're going to, we're going to see what God's Word has to say about it. I think you'll be encouraged. But first, let's pray. Father, it truly is humbling when we think about and reflect as a people how far we have come. But we know that there will be an end. And we know that our end is going to be with you. But in the meantime, you're choosing to leave us here to be a part of this nation, a part of this society, a part of these people. And it's very comforting to know that that light still shines. Maybe not from the nation that is the city on the hill, but it shines from you, Jesus. And that glory that is within our hearts by your Holy Spirit it can still shine within our lives, out to our families and our co-workers, our friends. So, Lord, we just ask that you now, by your word and by your spirit's teaching, that you would shine into our hearts and bring forth, please, the light of your glorious gospel. We know that it's there. We love it. We love you. We ask you these things, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. I truly believe that the apex, kind of the pinnacle point of our nation, was probably back, in my estimation, probably back in the 40s, in the 1940s. And then Pearl Harbor happened. And for those of you who are here or maybe listening who remember that date, I mean, it's, it's something even more horrendous back then uh, than what we just saw. But what happened at that point was pretty much miraculous as it did truly galvanize our entire nation. And it brought us to a point where we were willing to, regardless of our differences, but to unify together and to fight the axis of evil in Europe. There is a liberal journalist who um, used to anchor the NBC Nightly News named Tom Brokaw. That name may be you know, familiar to a lot of you. I'm not a personal fan of his, but he wrote a book one time. And it was called The Greatest Generation. It's an incredible read, and I would recommend it. But in that book, he describes the very men and the women who lived during that time. There was also a miniseries that was produced about 20 years ago. It was actually in 2001 when it first came out. And you've heard maybe some things about it before. But it's called Band of Brothers. And Band of Brothers uh, follows a, uh, the Easy Company, who is out of, uh, they're part of the 104th, uh, 101st Airborne. And they actually trained not too far from here. Um, the 101st trained over at uh, Camp Tacoa in Tacoa, Georgia. I've been through that camp. It's pretty neat to be able to walk through and see. 
but they, it was a parachuting um, uh, company. And as they got through with their training there at Camp Tekoa, um, they were transferred over to England. Now, anybody here from England may remember that. Uh, Adele, you're going to be reading that, I'm sure. <laughs> Oliver probably would. But they, they then went from that particular camp, they were stationed in horse stables. Yeah, I reckon the English didn't think a whole lot of us back then. But anyway, we got probably some nice horse stables. I don't know if they were air conditioned or not. But they finished their training there, and then they became a part. Uh, one of their, their first things they did was they became a part of uh, Operation Overlord. And if you know your history, you'll know that was D-Day, the 6th of June, 1944. And the miniseries Tom Hanks and, and, and some other guys uh, produced it follows Easy Company all the way from D-Day, uh, from Tamp Camp Tekoa actually, all the way through D-Day and right on up to the capture of the Eagle's Nest where Hitler's you know, main headquarters was and then right on through to the end of the war. They have disassembled those horse stables in England and they brought them over here and they reassembled them. They're over here at Camp Tekoa. So if you ever go by there and you wanna see it, you get to see I mean, a, a piece of history. Uh, where one of our allies you know, was so crucial in, in, in the part of that. My dad used to be a mechanic back during the war, and he worked on um, planes. And the RAF, this is before we entered the war, but the Royal Air Force, the RAF, sent their uh, pilots over here to Camden, South Carolina, where we're born and raised. And those pilots trained the RAF to fly these um, Stearman uh, P-17s, I think they were called. It was like a biplane, a bi-wing plane. And um, just a little piece of history there, but uh, we got to know a lot of the, the RAF pilots and everything. Then there was a lot of you know, uh, exchange friendships back then. But anyway, there was a journalist, uh, his name was Paul Clinton. And he was speaking about this miniseries, The Band of Brothers. And he said, it is a remarkable testament to the generation of citizen soldiers. Now, there were some soldiers that were, you know, that came through the Naval Academy, that maybe came through West Point, and there were officers whenever they went in. The vast majority of those boys that served and some girls, they were citizen soldiers. And he said, they responded when called upon to save the world for a democracy and then quietly returned to build the nation that we all now enjoy and all too often take for granted. And that last statement just kind of leapt off the page when I read that, that we just, we've taken so much for granted. And after the war, of course, <clears throat> What happened is they, they did come back and they started rebuilding this nation. We had just come off of just a very horrible time in history called the Depression. A lot of people lost their lives, lost their farms, lost so much during that time. But when those boys and, and girls came back from overseas, they settled down and they started rebuilding, rebuilding, rebuilding. And as they did, they, they built you know, the infrastructures and they built the cities, they built the the uh, manufacturing process, all of that. And we started really growing as a country. And as we grew, we became more prosperous. And as we became more prosperous, we grew. And then, you know, we, as you cross over into the 50s, then, I mean, we were just kind of at our height right then, or beginning to be. And it was at that time, and you've heard it spoken many times from up here, about how God began to give us over because at that time during the 50s and on into the 60s, a sexual revolution was taking place. And people were, things were just getting, they were changing so rapidly. And God allowed us to, he gave us over, you know, to that, you know, sexual revolution. And then later gave us over to that militant homosexual uh, revolution that, that hit. And pretty soon, he gave us over to a depraved mind, to the, to the evil that was in men's hearts as they began to do anything that they, that they desired. And God gave us over, and he's given us over. So that's where we are today. 
And that's why I say I, I look kind of at the 40s as the pinnacle uh, of what happened during that time. But since then, we as a nation uh, have, have gone the other way. So what I want to do now is I want to take a look at a particular period in Israel's history where they had the same sense of national pride uh, because of you know, what God was doing in them. And what we're going to do is start off in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to take a look at what they were going through and what they did and how we can maybe avoid some of the pitfalls that are out there. <clears throat> I like to think of this as Moses' swan song, uh, kind of like we say that um, 2 Timothy is Paul's swan song. Uh, Moses was not going to be able to go over. He couldn't cross over with the children of Israel. You remember why? He spoke the rock, smote it the second time when God said, speak to it. Moses was an incredible man. He wrote the five books of the Pentateuch. Incredible man. But the best of men, men at best. Even Moses. So he was not allowed to go over, but what he's doing is he's, he's pinning these words here just to remind Israel of their past and of what God has spoken and to give them warnings about their future. And so that's what he does in the eighth chapter here. Let's begin at verse 1. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you live and you multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you to know what was in your heart. Now, <clears throat> did God want to know what was in their hearts? <clears throat> no, he knew. Was it John 2.25 says, or 2.24 and 25 says, Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And he had no need that anyone should testify of man because he knew what was in man. God knew what was in them. But he allowed this testing to take place back during the wilderness to show them what was in their hearts whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you. He allowed you to hunger, and he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Every word means every word. Not just out of the Pentateuch, but, you know, Paul said later on in Romans uh, 15, 4, he says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. And he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, he said, Now all these things happened to them, and he's speaking about the children of Israel that were going through the, the desert wanderings. He said, All these things happened to him, uh, excuse me, to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition. And that word admonition can be teaching or it could be warning. They were written to kind of kind of warn us, upon whom the ends of the age have come. He said, so man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. He had to remind them about these things. He said, just remember, your, your clothes never wore out. Your feet didn't swell because in another verse it says, talking about how your sandals didn't wear out. And you know, that's not soja or fescue grass they were walking through. Um, there was like rocks everywhere. And, and they were going through some really tough terrain, but yet their sandals never wore out. So he's, he's just saying, just remember this. He said, you should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills. He said, you just come through this desert wandering for the last 40 years. Now, 
those that died were age 20 and above, right? From that former generation. So the oldest you had was 19 at the time that survived. So at this point in time, the oldest guys there, besides Joshua and Caleb, are 59 years old or less. But they remembered the things from the wanderings all the way through. They remembered the, the thirst that they experienced. And what he's saying now is, yeah, you were thirsty then, and God tested you to show you what was in your heart because he gave you thirst. And then instead of speaking to a rock or smiting a rock, he said, in this new land, you're going to have brooks of water, fountains, springs that flow out of valleys and hills. Then he switches gears and he says, in a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. Yeah, you hungered and then you murmured and then God gave you manna. Yeah, but over here, you're going to have so much food. And he's describing all of that. And he said, a land whose stones are iron, and out of hills whose hills you will dig copper. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he's given you. That's the first half of that chapter. And he's just you know, saying, just remember, remember this. Don't forget this. Make sure you do that. And he's encouraging them. The last half, he kind of ramps up the warning a little bit. He starts off in verse 11. <clears throat> he says, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them. And I started thinking about when I was reading this, what happened after our, our men and women came back after World War II and they came back into the land. And this begins to describe where we were, where we kind of parallel in history. And when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, your soup, excuse me, your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage who led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which there were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water out, from you, out for you from the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the end. All of that is one statement. He said, beware that you don't forget, lest you know, all these things that were done. He said, to do you good in the end. <clears throat> there was a, um, a vision that God gave Jeremiah, and he showed him these two baskets of figs. One was a basket of good figs, one was a basket of, of bad figs. And he said regarding that, he says, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge those who are being carried away captive from Judah, whom I have sent out of this place for their own good. He said, hey, I'm taking you out of here, and it's for your own good. And he said, into the land of the Chaldeans. So I'm going to send you to, to the Babylonians. I'm going to send you there, but it's for your own good. He's re, you know, is reminding the people through him, through Jeremiah. For I, have, I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. So he says there in verse 16 that he might test you, but to, to do you good in the end. I, everything that God allows into our life, from his perspective, he's allowing it for our good. Now, you got to stand up in front of the mirror sometimes and say, it's for my good. It's for my good. Yeah. you, you got to convince yourself of that when you're in the middle of going through some things. But from his perspective, yeah, Romans 8, 28, we, we wear that one out, but it's truth. Yeah, he will cause all things to work together for our good, yeah, for those that love him. So he says, then... It, so he said all of that, just remember when you've eaten and you're full and all this other stuff. He says, then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth, my power. And what I began thinking about was what have we identified ourselves as a nation since the, the end of the war? 
and, and through the 50s and 60s, 70s and everything. Are we not the world's superpower? That's what, that's what we call ourselves. We are the superpower of the world. And he said, don't forget this. When God's brought you through all these things that you start saying that it was by my power and the might of my good hand that's gained me this wealth. It's, it's our ingenuity and it's our resourcefulness as a nation that we have built this very prosperous country. Used, used to be anyway. But yeah, he says, don't forget that, that it wasn't you that did that. But see, we have forgotten, right? We've forgotten. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that you may buy whatever car you want and whatever house you want, and you can fill your barns with stuff. Let's see, what version have you guys got? A <laughs> little, little different? Okay. He gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as this day. So he's giving us the power and the ability to get wealth that he can establish his covenant. It's probably a good time to go back and revisit that one little statistic, you know, uh, of all the professing Christians, how many truly tithe? 2%. So we got 2% of us and, you know, probably 100% of you that are helping God to establish his covenant on there. He said, I'm giving you the power to get wealth. And the, the, the least Whoever makes the less money, however I can say this, whoever makes the less money in this room on an annual basis is richer than you know, how much percent of the world. A, a, a staggering amount. And so, but he's given us the power to get well. He says, so don't forget that either. He may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God. There again, he's in this warning mode. He said, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord God destroys before you, so you shall perish, because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. So he's giving them this warning that this is going to happen if you forget. This is going to happen if you, if you steer away from God's commandments. Daniel was praying in, um, in chapter 9 in his prayer uh, to God. And here's Daniel you know, in Babylon. And in his prayer, he looks up, he says, To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, what we just read, written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us because we've sinned and against him. We and he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole of heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. So that he was, Jeremiah was just, um, excuse me, Daniel was just in his prayer. He's going like, we've, we've got what we deserve, you know, because we did, you know, uh, go apart from you. What I want to do now is um, fast forward just a little bit. Turn to, uh, let's turn to Joshua, chapter 3. So we have Moses repeatedly warning his people you know, over and over again, don't forget. Make sure you remember to do this. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 3. <clears throat> For the sake of time, we're just, you know, we're going to go right over Joshua 1 and 2. Remember, in Joshua 1, uh, the Lord speaks, excuse me, the, yeah, the Lord speaks to Joshua, and he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. And then he begins encouraging him and saying, but you, be strong and be courageous. You know, don't let this book of the law depart out of your mouth, but you know, meditate therein day and night that you can see how to do what's written therein. And, and the Lord just is encouraging him. 
you know, to be ready for what's going to happen. So he says, Moses, my servant is dead. Arise, let's go over this Jordan. I'm in chapter one. You stay in three. And then he goes, only be strong and courageous that you may observe according to the law. And the people answered him. They answered Joshua when he said these things to them. He said, so they answered Joshua. You're going to love this. All that you command us, we will do. And whatever, wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we heeded Moses. <clears throat> I reckon you're thinking that Joshua's got, he's forgotten. So we can say this. Just as we heeded Moses, we will heed you. Only let the Lord your God be with you. In other words, it might be your fault if something does happen. As he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words and all that you command him shall be put to death. Man, they were fired up. I mean, their national pride and unity was there. It's like anybody that even begins to depart from what you say, Joshua, they're going to die. You know, because just like we heeded Moses, you know, we're going we're gonna to heed you. Love it. Okay, chapter 2, Rahab. And we know the story there where she hides the spies. And we're going to go right over that. So <clears throat> let's take a look at uh, Joshua 3 and pick it up at verse 5. And Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and they went over before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the, in the sight of all Israel, that they may know, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priest who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come, hear, and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he without fail will drive out from before you. He will drive out from before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over the Jordan before you. So he's preparing them for them to go across. And let's go into, uh, let's take a look at chapter four now and pick it up at verse one. <clears throat> We're going to go through seven. And it came to pass when all the people had completely passed over the Jordan, had crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from every tribe and command them saying, take for yourselves 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. So they had already passed over. It was still dry ground. So he sends these 12 men back into the bed of the, of the Jordan and to pick up these stones. So then it says, verse 4, Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take on take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. So they didn't pick up these little rocks like this and say, I got mine. You know? No, you could, you could see they're probably picking up some pretty good stones that they had to put them on their shoulder. And so when they did that, he said, chapter, uh, let's see, verse 6, <clears throat> that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Remember that question. We're going to revisit it. What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off from before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones, this is pretty impactful, these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel for how long? Forever. That was the intent. These stones right here, forever. 
Really? <laughs> Do you remember where this place was where they took these stones and they set up the memorial, what the name of the town was or the name of that place? Gilgal, and it means the rolling, and have the waters roll back. That was where this memorial was set up. Gilgal is the, um, is the place where they crossed over the Jordan. They set up encampment there, and to the men's delight, they were circumcised. And when they got over that, then they shared the first Passover at Gilgal. Gilgal acted almost like a base camp from which they would do their exploits. They would go out and you know, conquer some areas, they'd come back into Gilgal. And eventually Gilgal began to be a place where uh, there was like a pilgrimage that they would go to on an annual basis. So we see that Joshua's intent that these memorial stones were going to remain there forever. And they would be a point of remembrance for what God had done to them. So you've got all these that are less than 59 years old, and then you've got these teenagers and these younger uh, kids. They've seen these, this wall of water. They've, they've seen the Jordan stand up, and they literally got to walk through. So all of those who didn't remember that from the Red Sea crossing, like some of the older ones did, they got to see this again. And so they saw them walking across on the dry ground. So that's Joshua's intent. This is going to be like a memorial here forever. And now we're going to fast forward one more time, and we're going to look at Judges. Because we're about to enter into a period where every man began to do what was right in his own eyes, right? And so... Take a look at Judges chapter 3. One of the judges that God raised up during that time was a guy, his name was Ehud, Ehud, E-H-U-D, however you pronounce that. And at this time, Moab had come across and they had captured a lot of the Israeli territory. They captured Jericho. And that's where uh, Eglon, he was the king of Moab. He was kind of setting up his, his field office right there. And God sent Ehud to be able to rescue the children of Israel. He was one of the judges. He was going to rescue them from Eglon. Remember, Eglon is the guy who ate at uh, Golden Corral a lot, you know, big buffet. He was a big, big guy. And Ehud's knife got buried in the folds. Read about it sometime. Y'all hungry yet? <laughs> so anyway... Um, he, all right, get a handle on it. Um, so it, it, what, what part of the plot was is that, you know, he was going to, he and some other guys from Israel were going to come over and bring a tribute to Eglon. And they left the tribute there with him, with Eglon. And then he says, okay, we're going to head on back. So they departed from there, um, Ehud and the rest of his guys. But Ehud came back. All right, let me catch up with you. Judges 3. Okay, let's look at verse 15. But when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gerod, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. By him the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud had made himself a dagger, it's a double-edged and a cubit in length, and he fastened it under its clothes on his right thigh. So he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man, so I wouldn't be judging of him. You know, the word word says that, so I can't apologize for it. So anyway, uh, so that brings us up to to, to where we are. And he says, and when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. Now, he actually went with them. And you can see this in some other, uh, uh, some other writings that come out. Uh, but he, it says that he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal. Now, that particular word for stone images is pesilim, Pestilim. And what that means is the, uh, it's always meant like 
carved out of a quarry and or hand carved. It's always used to describe stone images or hand carved images uh, that were idols. And what these were, in all probability, were some that Moab had brought over into Israel. It was their gods. So the reason I say that is that when you go from where the, the place of the memorial stones that were taken to Gilgal, and the next time we see Gilgal appearing is that they actually have these stone images, these the idols. Now there's idols in. So we, we start seeing this, this, this curve. It's going down. So you go from these memorial stones are going to be here forever. And now we've got idols present in the land. So it says, he himself turned back from the stone idols that were Gilgal. And he said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And then the rest is history as far as what he did. But so now we look at a further progression of Gilgal. And here's this place where these stones are going to be forever, right? Well, Pretty soon, it was full-blown where Gilgal went. And this, this whole transition from memorial stones forever to now these idols are present there. And in Hosea, God is speaking. And it says in Hosea 9.15, For their wickedness is in Gilgal. For there I hated them because of the evil of their deeds. I will drive them from my house. What a transition that they made in Gilgal. Gilgal is just an example for us. So now I want to revisit Moses' instructions once more. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read a couple of them for you. He had said previously to what we read in Deuteronomy 4, 9, he said, only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. He said also in Deuteronomy 4.23, he said, again, take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and you make for yourself carved images in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. So he, he's given them this warning ahead of time. Remember the, the video that we opened up with? What were the last words that were shown on the video? You remember? Never forget. Never forget. That was one of the biggest problems they had, and it's, it's one of, truly one of the biggest problems that we have in our own life. I remember my first job that I had at a little grocery store, the guy that owned it, he would say, Glenn, I need you to do this. You know, put up the produce, go break down the boxes, and then... Uh, and you know, later on he comes and say, "Okay, did you get it done? Yes, sir. I uh, put up the produce. What about the boxes? What about this?" And he just and it was, went on for just a little while. And he said, "Glenn, let me, he pulled me aside and said, let me tell you something." He said, "A short pencil is better than a long memory." He said, "You start writing down what I tell you." Yes, sir. And and I, and I survived. But we forget. That's that's just human nature. That's what we do. We forget. And where our, nation, where our nation is concerned, we've forgotten our spiritual roots. We've moved so far away from them. And I'm talking about we as a nation. I'm not talking about us here in this body. And why we were founded originally as a nation to escape tyranny and religious persecution and to be able to freely worship the Lord our God. Now talk about a word of warning. Psalms 917 says, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. That's a pretty dire warning. I put all in caps right here, because all, I think, in the Hebrew means all. You know. All nations that forget God. As has been stated many times here before, as I said earlier, yeah, the, the, the culture is lost, and there's not a whole lot that we can do to turn us back into like some kind of a, a godly nation again. But there is something that we can do where we and our families are concerned. 
And Pastor Darren, if you want to go ahead and lower the screen, <clears throat> Micah is going to ask me a question that is from Joshua 4, 6. So I need you to reach under your seat. And you can hold that up, kind of hold it around. People are not going to be able to see it, but they will in just a second when you show a picture. But ask me the question. What did these stones mean to you? What do these stones mean to me? And this is what they look like. I keep this in my study at the house. That's olive oil poured on them. It's kind of a snake. But um, several years ago, a little over 15 years ago, thank you, Pastor Darren. Um, we were approached, Terry and I were approached um, by a guy who's a, a real you know, sharp business guy, uh, owns a really nice business here in town. And he said, um, there is a community down on Lake Greenwood. It's called Grand Harbor. It's a new and upcoming community, gated community. They're selling property, lakefront property there. I've already bought a lot. And I was wondering, would you guys like to go in with me on another lot? I'm thinking like, slam dunk, you know? This is 2006. I mean, what could go wrong? <laughs> So, in my infinite wisdom, my, my prayer was, Lord, thank you for this opportunity <laughs> to go in partnership with this man that I know doesn't know you. Yeah, I'm being unequally yoked together with an unbeliever, but, but look at this opportunity, Lord. So, I, I know you've got to be in this. There's a lot of the unspoken words that express what my actions were. So we go down this road, and those lots were selling for like a large amount of money. But the bank, who's kind of in on all this development, they, um, they loaned us the money, and it was what they call a balloon loan. Oh, yeah. Somebody's getting some chills. Yeah, I remember those. <laughs> and so we start going down this road, and everything is great. We're just going to hang on to the property for maybe a couple of years, yeah, and then flip it, right? I mean, makes sense. I mean, surely the Lord's behind that. <laughs> so, I mean, just think of the tie that I can do off of the prophets. So, surely he'll be with us. Well, then there's this pop. And the value of that land, which starts off up here, starts going down like this. And the guy that we were in partners with, he defaults on his piece of property. Helps us out a little bit with ours, but then he defaults on ours. And so that fell on Terry and I. And so we paid the exorbitant regime fees every month. We paid the taxes every year. We did our end of the bargain. We took his part of it. As God began to teach me. What a lesson. At the same time, I had... Um, made a change in my employment and that I went to work for a startup part of our company. Willingly did so. But when I did so, my, uh, my income went like literally in half because I saw the opportunity. And it's paid off, it's, it's goes going really well 15 years later. But during that time, so we have my income going like this and we have the, you know, the, the dollar amounts putting out going like that. And one day I get a call from the bank, ah, oh, yeah, we're gonna call your note because we're at the end of seven years. Okay, you're gonna call my note and you want me to, they wanted me to renew it and it was for up here. Lots were selling for about a sixth. That's what they were actively selling for. So I said, you want me to sign a note for this exorbitant amount of money on a lot that's only worth this much right here? Yeah, that's exactly what we're saying. I said, can't do that. Not a problem. We're going to go ahead and file a judgment on you. And for the legal minds in here, a judgment lasts for 10 years. And if I were to sell my house, they would take the profits. I can't go buy anything. You know, I can't go borrow money. 
I, we're going to have a judgment on us for 10 years. <clears throat> or I could take the road that, that um, our you know, business partner took. He just declared bankruptcy. Those are my options. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> we hired a lawyer and began you know, confirming with her and everything. And, and she just said, yeah, they're, they're drawing the hard line, Glenn. I mean, this, you, you, you don't have any options. You either need to declare bankruptcy or they're going to hit you with a judgment. Thank you, how much did I pay for that advice? <laughs> and all of this was coming down to one day at the end of April that they had given us. And the clock was ticking. We were down to the last day, pretty much the last hour. And, um, and the bank had not relinquished. I had come back to them and said, look, these lots are selling for this. I'll give you this. I'm going to give you much more than what this thing is worth. And they said, not interested. You know, we're the bank, you know, and we've got you legally where we want you. Their word, I mean, you know, they didn't say that, but they said it with their actions. <clears throat> I didn't have any options. One day, yeah, here we go again. I remember it very vividly, <clears throat> and I get a phone call from the lawyer the last day of the month. Last hour of the day, she goes, I just got a call from the bank. They're going to take your offer. I said, really? Everything changed. Everything changed. And through the help of my siblings, I was able to gather up the money needed, and I made the first payment on that loan. And then I walked in the next week, and we paid it off. I said, we're done. Got to take care of my brothers and sisters now, but yeah, we're done. <laughs> and so one day, Terry and I went out, and we gathered some stones, and we put them at the base of a tree on that lot that we still owed, and we're still paying regime fees on for another couple of years, but it's okay. We put them at the base of the tree, and we knelt. It's if we will always <laughs> remember what you did, we won't forget. And I keep that picture in my study. And with the guys that come over on the first, and if you walk through there, you'll see it. But it reminds us every time we look at it, the faithfulness of our God. It's insignificant to some people in some people's eyes. You know, Glenn, you got yourself in that. What did what, you think was going to happen? I didn't think that was going to happen. <laughs> but God was faithful. Amen. And eventually we sold the piece of property for a pittance. <laughs> but it's okay. Because we took, we took something away from there that you could never teach me in a university, mm -hmm. only there, only there. As we close, I mean, some of you, <clears throat> you may be going through like a dark time right now. Yeah, we are, another one, darker than that. You may be going through something right now with your family, and if not, you, know, you may be later on. It could happen. But my word to you now is I would strongly encourage you, strongly encourage you, particularly you young, you know, moms and dads, but even for all of us others, that you begin to make these type of memorials something where you, God has done something in your life. Don't let it go. You know why? You'll forget. Don't forget. So there may be one day you can look back with your children as they grow older and they see these different pictures you have in your house or these different objects you have on display which are a little bit weird. And maybe they say, what do these stones 
What have you stolen from me to you? And he'll give you an opportunity to sit down with them and to say, let me tell you the story behind those stones. This is what God did. It is a true living color picture of the living God in your life and what he did to bring you through to help them, your children, your grandchildren, to help them never, ever forget. The psalmist who wrote Psalm 119, he says so many different times in the psalm, I will not forget. You got a guess on how many times it was? You got two choices. Seven. Seven. You got it. He says in verse 16, I will not forget your word. Verse 83, yet I do not forget your statutes. He says that again in verse 93, yet I do not forget your statutes. Verse 109, yet I do not forget your law. Verse 141, yet I will, I do not forget your precepts. 53, 153, for I do not forget your law. Again, in the last verse, of Psalm 119, the longest psalm in there. He says in verse 176, for I do not forget your commandments. So my word to you is don't forget. Don't forget. Remember his word. Remember his faithfulness. Remember his loving kindness. And remember that his mercies endure forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we know that we, as even your people, that you call, that you chose, whom you died for, Lord Jesus, in spite of all that you've done for us, we still forget. But we just ask you, Lord, to help us individually to be able to reach back into our memories and maybe even to go back in retrospect and, and create some type of small memorial that we can look at and that we can have our children and our grandchildren look at and we can explain the goodness and the mercies and the grace and the love of our Lord and our God who's taken us through the wilderness and has seen us through to the other side. And you'll see us all the way through to the end. But Lord, help us to remember. Because we will forget. But help us to not to. But to remember all that you've done. Oh, we bless you for it. Thank you for your word. Because it helps us to remember. Your loving kindness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.